Departamento de Ciências da Comunicação, FCSH, UNL. Professor of Ghana is of English and Comparative Literature at Harvard University. And he is the author of The German of Ideas, Platonic Provocations in Theater and Philosophy, in the Philosophy, uh, published in Oxford University Press, I guess. Um, poetry and Revolution, Marx Manifestos and the Avant Garde, uh, Princeton. Um, stage fright, modernism, and theatrically in the in drama, Hopkins, as well as of uh, numerous edits, volumes, and first books, including Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, The Communist Manifesto, and other the writings. He is the general editor of Northern Anthology of World Literature, uh, already third edition, and he also writes on literature drama and politics for the London Review of Books, uh, where you can both film, remember, concerning and inside higher ed. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulo Montero and the organizing committee. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a privilege to start this conference, and it is a, it's a pleasure because this theme of the conference, theater and philosophy, or drama and philosophy, is something that has been on my mind ever since I was a philosophy major in college, uh, during which time I also did a lot of theater. And it, it so happened that the Black Box Theater, where we did a lot of student theater, was directly underneath the auditorium, in the space left by the auditorium, uh, um, where during the day we listened to philosophy lectures, and for everyone in this room, this setup will immediately conjure the platonic K for philosophy <laughs> happens upstairs in daylight, you see the sun, and so on and so forth, and downstairs in the K of the Black Box Theater is where um, theater happens. And, and I think ever since I've been trying to figure out whether that's the appropriate architectural and theoretical constellation. Uh, so this, this interest in, in, in theater and philosophy has met, led me to a, to a longer research project that ended in a, in a recent book called The Drama of Ideas, where I indeed took Plato as a point of departure for thinking about theater and philosophy. A, because Plato, of course, is responsible for what's sometimes called the anti-theatrical prejudice in philosophy, or what perhaps I would like to describe as a kind of recurring critique of the theater and philosophy. Uh, but also because Plato, as we all know, uh, not only was intensely interested in the theater, as is testified to in such moments as the cave, the theatrical cave, but also because he wrote in the dramatic form of the philosophical dialogue. And, and so I, I use Plato as a point of departure, as I said, both for thinking about uh, philosophers interested in the theater, like Nietzsche and so on and so forth, all the way to Alain Badiou, Iris Murdoch, and Alain Badiou, I noticed someone is going to talk about Iris Murdoch, but also for a kind of history of drama that's interested in philosophy and, and ideas. So, so that was sort of my bigger attempt to, to answer this question, what is the relationship between theater and philosophy? But as often happens there, I felt that there was some unfinished business uh, left. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about today, uh, namely focus on what is arguably the most important strain of the 20th century, certainly philosophy, but thought more generally. And after hearing the introductions, it seems like I'm in the right place here, namely the philosophy of language. Um, so the main object of the talk today is to think about dramatic, but actually not just dramatic, uh, responses to Ludwig Wittgenstein, the, the central figure in, the, in, in, in language philosophy. But before I talk about these various, what I call, dramatic airs, that is writers, dramatists, 
so novelists and poets to some extent who responded to Wittgenstein and integrated his language philosophy in their work. So a good example of philosophy and drama. Before I, I, I give you a kind of panorama of, of their work, and some figures I'm sure will be familiar, others perhaps less so, I want to pause for a second and think about the, um, the stakes, the intellectual stakes of, of this project. And put in the most general terms, I would say that uh, it has to do with the fate of, of language philosophy. I, I, with some exaggeration, it could be said that the 20th century was the century of language philosophy. Language, but if we look to the beginning of the century, or the beginning of the 20th century, was the cause of race, despair, leading some writers and philosophers to talk about the crisis of, the crisis of language. But also the cause of greatest promise, almost utopian promise. Figures like Rudolf Carnot and his project of a kind of logical reconstruction of language. So people couldn't agree about whether language needed to be reformed, something that George Bernard Shaw and many others advocated, or purified, like Karl Kraus wanted to, um, and how it should be studied. Um, but even though they couldn't agree on what their take on language was, they all agreed pretty much that language was the key, that the path to knowledge led through language. Um, now, if, 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 if it's legitimate to say that the 20th century was the host of something you might call the drama of language, how it should be studied, what, and everything. Wittgenstein was a strong queen. <laughs> he contributed several of the most important theories of language uh, with various self-appointed heirs fighting over his course. But I think despite Wittgenstein's influence, perhaps even his growing or at least more widespread influence now, I think it's fair to say that the drama of language seems to me placed increasingly to smaller houses. And I, I noticed that this contraction with some regret that this drama of language is what drew me first into uh, academia as a philosophy major and then in my subsequent work. And the, the appeal of language was simply that it somehow promised to explain the world. That's at least how it seemed to me. And that in order to understand language, you needed to study some combination of language philosophy and literature, which precisely is, is, is what I did. Now, my problem is, and I think it's not just my problem, um, is that um, I, I no longer quite believe that language is the path to knowledge. And I think there's something in our current intellectual moment um, that, that has displaced the importance of the language of a philosophy of language from the center of intellectual energy, let's say. It used to be that other disciplines looked to language philosophy and those who studied language uh, um, for inspiration. And I think, again, this is very general and I would, I'd like some pushback from you if you don't agree. It seems to me that, the, uh, that we now look to other disciplines, sociology, economics, to understanding the world. And this is very crude and very schematic, but this is sort of what's in the back of my mind, and that's why I wanted to say this as a kind of framing of what, what the ultimate stakes are for this meditation on language, language philosophy, and dramatic and the very responses to it. So even though this is a kind of melancholy story, at least for me that I'm telling, I think there's a silver lining, and the silver lining is uh, composed of these literary and dramatic airs of, of, of Wittgenstein. When I contemplate their work, and it starts in the, in the 50s and 60s, but culminates in the 80s and 90s, I, I, I sometimes think of, of these literary uh, airs of Wittgenstein as exemplifying a kind of last flowering of this language century, a uh, final almost extravagant celebration of the powers and mysteries um, of language and homage uh, to the time when language ruled the world, in part uh, because I think they were incredibly smart and perceptive about language and literary heirs uh, uh, of Wittgenstein. They noticed things about 
Wittgenstein's language philosophy that many philosophers didn't easily notice, uh, and they also continued, and this is something I want to emphasize, Wittgenstein's own struggle and work with writing philosophy with different genres and modes of writing could be something that's really central to Wittgenstein. Um, so this explains perhaps also this emphasis on writing why Wittgenstein had literary heirs in the first place. Uh, now, I'm sure many people here have come across the famous claim uh, Wittgenstein made with respect to the Tractatus, um, namely that this work, the Tractatus, is entirely philosophical, but also entirely literary at the same time. Now, this, this claim is a good place to start thinking about the relation between Wittgenstein and literature, and hence about these literary heirs. Though I want to also start with the word of caution, since that sentence that the Tractatus is both philosophical and literary at the same time comes from a, a letter Wittgenstein wrote to his publisher when he was pretty desperate to get his work published. And he wrote to the editor of a, of a literary journal trying to pitch his work as being uh, literary as well as philosophical, when perhaps in truth it was in some strange way neither, uh, uh, or another word way to describe this is to say that it was Wittgenstinian. Um, in any case, um, there's some caution uh, we have to exercise when it comes to literature and philosophy, and I think both for this conference as a whole and certainly for my talk, uh, I want to say that in thinking about the relationship, it, it's not a matter of trying to level the distinction between literature and philosophy. I think in some sense we need to highlight the distinction and then look at the various interactions in, in intersections. So um, um, among these literary heirs of Wittgenstein, there were many who were primarily struck by Wittgenstein's own struggle with the form and style of writing, and who were inspired to continue the struggle with their own literary pro uh, projects. So by approaching Wittgenstein through his style, they also called attention to this you will, stylistic or literary dimension of this philosophy. So, so who are they, these literary heirs? Let me present some of the to you. Now, perhaps unsurprising, um, given that Wittgenstein spent most of his time in Austria and England, the earliest responses to Wittgenstein came from Oxbridge and Vienna. So, the first one I want to talk about briefly is, is Iris Murdoch, and I think we're going to hear more about her uh, uh, later today, um, whose own work, of course, straddles the literature, drama, and, and philosophy. And she, too, was very insistent that she didn't want to merge uh, uh, the relation between the two. Her, her most notable and most interesting, I think, response to Wittgenstein is her novel, Under the Net, from 1955 written only a few years after Wittgenstein's death. Now, under the net approaches Wittgenstein from the perspective of an observer narrator named Jake. Uh, and Jake reports to us throughout the novel about his uh, acquaintance with a character named Hugo, son of a rich German-Jewish weapons manufacturer who lives a Spartan life in England and is a mesmerizing interlocutor. Um, slightly more radical in this respect than Wittgenstein himself, Hugo refuses to write at all, insisting on natural spoken dialogue as the only form of expression. And his philosophy is radically anti-metaphysical, mostly intent on falsifying the statements of others. And faced with this brilliant talker, uh, our narrator, Jake, begins to write down the conversations he's had with Hugo, polishes them, and finally ends up publishing them without telling Hugo to notable success. So, but he doesn't tell Hugo, Hugo about it. Unable to face his philosophical friend after this betrayal, that is, after publishing an, in an unauthorized manner these dialogues, he breaks off the friendship with him, only to find out much later that Hugo actually never even recognized these published and written dialogues as, as his own because they seemed so different to his mind from what he actually said and, and, and from the medium of live speech. 
So the Socratic echoes here are very obvious. Uh, and, and in fact, Iris Murdoch would go on to try her own hand at the Socratic dialogue, in the form of the Socratic dialogue, in, 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 in a work called Akastos, which consists of two dialogues revolving around Socrates and his friends, who are discussing, perhaps anachronistically, mostly 20th century problems of, of aesthetics and ethics. Now, under the net, the novel I've been talking about is quite a conventional in form. What's interesting about it is that it's fascinated with this form of the dialogue. Now, um, the narrator's project, uh, uh, though, keeps the dialogue also at a distance because uh, Aris Murdoch knows better than to try to render these mesmerizing dialogues in her own novel. So she keeps a certain distance. The novel is really a kind of narrative novel without giving us the dialogue. Keeping these dialogues at a distance. The novel talks about them, talks about the effects of them, but doesn't give them to us directly. So uh, one could say that Murdoch approaches Wittgenstein from two angles. First, she presents him as a figure with all the attributes uh, that contributed to turning Wittgenstein into this kind of mystique and charismatic fig figure, uh, the effects on, on his associates, with many of his friends and associates reported, kind of larger than life figure. Uh, the rich foreign provenance, the quasi-saintly austerity of his life, his mesmerizing effect on others. But the, the sex, so that's important. <coughs> we will return to that uh, uh, trope of presenting Wittgenstein as a figure, a fascination of him as a personal figure. But the second is generic. Um, uh, Wittgenstein is presented as someone struggling with and against the written word, a figure existing in spoken discourse that cannot be captured by a kind of latter-day Plato who hopes to take down Socrates' conversations. Instead, we have the relatively traditional form of an observer narrator observing the problem that you shine and struggle with expression and I think from the safe distance afforded to him to this narrator by the established form of the novel. So this is all I'm going to say about Iris Murdoch and rush on to the next early response to Wittgenstein, which is also novelistic, uh, namely by Thomas Bernhardt in his uh, novel The Comic Tour from 1975. So this is 20 years later. We're moving quite fast. Um, now, unsurprisingly, perhaps Bernhardt looks at Wittgenstein, who is more thinly disguised uh, than Hugo in Murdoch's novel, that is closer to the historical Wittgenstein, from Austria. So this is uh, um, Bernhardt's point of view. Um, Ludwig Reuthammer, the Wittgenstein character in his novel, is the son of a rich Austrian family, and he went to Cambridge to become a famous scientist, but also uh, though to a second degree, uh, a philosopher, and then returns to Austria to build a house for his sister. As we know, this is what Wittgenstein did. There's much more emphasis on Ludwig's Family back, Ludwig Reuthammer's family background, including a history of suicide in his family, as, as well as on Ludwig Reuthammer's attempt to extricate himself from this extended and established family. Again, we witness this through an observer narrator, so the same generic technique as Murdoch employed. Or rather, we don't quite witness it because the novel begins. When the novel begins, Ludwig Reuchermann has just hanged himself, and the narrator, our narrator, is going through his literary estate, whose executor he has become. Wittgenstein uh, is left a large amount of fragments, written fragments, but only fragments. Uh, original, in the beginning, our narrator is trying to get some order into these fragments and hopes to publish them, but pretty soon it becomes clear that he will not succeed. Uh, uh, and that this is a hopeless enterprise. It's clearly something uh, Thomas Bernhardt loves, hopeless enterprises. Um, Ludwig Reuthammer has left only fragments because he's an obsessive perfectionist, and that's another, uh, for those of you who know Thomas Bernhardt, another uh, type that, that fascinates him. Um, for example, the house that he's built for his sister is in the shape of a perfect cone 
erected in the middle of a large forest. Uh, the house uh, is the product of a perfectionistic obsession and in fact drives his sister mad and the implication is himself with the Roy Hummer to suicide. Now, um, in this novel, uh, Rabbi Kudi seeks to capture something about the figure of Wittgenstein, again, his obsessive perfectionism, his estranged relationship to Austria, his family entanglements, um, and uh, the way he materialized his approach to thinking, in particular to mathematics, by designing a, a, a building, an architectural building. But like Werner, I think. Bernhard does more than that, more than just dwell on this sort of cultural figure of Wittgenstein. He also engages Wittgenstein on the level of language. Karikatur is written in a distinct style that I would call comparative. The narrator constantly and obsessively and, in a sense, annoyingly, compares himself to Ludwig Reuthammer in, cas in cascades of sentences that go like this. Ludwig was like this, I was like that. Ludwig did this, I did that, and so on and so forth. And every page, there are many such comparisons. In this way, Werner tries to distill the relationship between the observer narrator and this absent Wittgensteinian protagonist. But these comparisons are not only a way to solve, or rather force into the forefront of our reading experience this narrative perspective, the distance between the narrator and and this Ludwig character. Comparisons, we learn, are also at the heart of Ludwig's philosophy. The narrator quotes it, quote, we must always have the possibility of comparison. Without the possibility of comparison, we cannot think, cannot act, nothing. Set forth. End of quote. The sentence also captures, as an aside, a, a second kind of stylistic tick or strategy in the recorded speech. Again, and this is, becomes annoying, though in an interesting way, almost each sentence contains this reminder that we are reading reported speech, and sometimes there are two, even three layers of sentences that then end with said Warren Hummer, said I, said he. So there are these kind of uh, 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 layers of, of reported speech. But as I said, more important for me in terms of the engagement, uh, Bernhardt's engagement with Wittgenstein, is this matter of comparison. Um, as we know, uh, Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein's actual philosophy, not just the fragments left behind by the character in this novel, um, is very centrally concerned with comparisons, with the, com the importance of comparison for, uh, for philosophy, though Wittgenstein also cautioned against comparison. I can talk more about this perhaps in the Q&A. So I think in his own day, Bernhard continues both Wittgenstein's perfectionism and his reliance on comparison in his own philosophy. That's, I think, the heart of his engagement with the substance, if you will, of, of uh, uh, Wittgenstein's thought. But I think Bernhard's novel can also be understood as a kind of cautionary tale. Wittgenstein was interested uh, in comparison, as I said, in holding different cases next to each other different examples side by side, but he was even more worried about the dangers, uh, the seduction almost, of comparison. And he always asked his listeners and readers to think about the grounds of comparison, of pointing to differences, moments when comparisons break down. In Bernhardt's novel, by contrast, comparisons are completely out of control, they dominate, they have completely taken over the thinking and the style of, of the novel. So um, he's, uh, I think Bernhard is, 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 in a sense, one could say, describing what happens when comparisons are, are out of control and have taken over someone's uh, thinking. So uh, let me just pause for a second and take stock. We have two novelistic approaches to Wittgenstein. They combine an engagement with Wittgenstein as a figure uh, with an, uh, I think, approach to the substance of his language philosophy. In, in Murdoch's case, primarily through this generic negotiation between novel of, and, 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 uh, um, and the dialogue uh, that revolves around this problem of live speech and how to record it. And in Murdoch's case, through this distinct style based on comparisons. So still going chronologically, I want to 
rush on to a third early response, this one from 1979, and here we have also finally uh, arrived at the drama proper, proper, then we come Stoddard's play Dogs, Hamlet, uh, from 1979, so just a few years after this was very nice. Uh, novel. And this move from the novel to drama um, is, I think, significant and, of course, of, of interest here. I should add that Bert Thomas Bernhardt himself undertook such a move. Um, he wrote a second Wittgenstein novel that I think is somewhat less interesting than the one I've been talking about for a tour called Wittgenstein's Nephew. But also, he wrote a play called Ritter Bene Foss which revolves again about a Wittgenstein character is dramatically speaking quite quite, quite interesting. Uh, um, so, um, but uh, um, the, the question is for us, what, what happens in this shift that I'm about to make between novelistic responses and dramatic responses? What does drama have to say about Wittgenstein? Murdoch might give us a first hint. I said that from the distance afforded to her by the form of the novel, Murdoch could observe in Wittgenstein a struggle with how to write dialogue, the elusive project of writing down speech. But the safe distance could also be seen as a kind of retreat. Murdoch didn't want to take up the challenge of philosophical, philosophical dialogue directly. In fact, as I said, when she did in these dialogues, in our customs wasn't particularly successful, I think. Uh, um, so um, what, what happens when dramatists get into the Wittgenstein game? Um, I think Stoppard is the most interesting of these dramatic responses, so let me talk a lot about him a little bit. Um, Stoppard's fullest engagement with Wittgenstein occurs in this play called Dog's Hamlet. It's a short play, and what's interesting about it, the way it's a direct response to Wittgenstein, is that it's based on a scene that comes early on in Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations. In, in the scene, um, Wittgenstein presents uh, two characters um, called A and B in the setting furnished with various building materials that lie around in piles. The chief action of this little scene concerns the relation between the action of these two characters and the words they use. A asks B a number of questions to which B then provides the answers. And the questions concern the various kind of building materials, cubes, and blocks that are lying around. Um, a initially asks B about the number of elements in each pile, but Wittgenstein uses this uh, scene to kind of think about how we acquire language. Um, more and more, he's interested in the theatrical enactment of the scene. Um, and uh, um, the, the key moment in these reflections is when Wittgenstein um, um, says, quote, well, what makes a difference is the manner in which one speaks the words in this language game with the cubes and the blocks. But in addition, the tone in which they are spoken will be different as well as the facial expression and other factors. So the pitch down here, characteristically very cute to not only what these characters say about the cues, and so on and so forth, but how they say it, facial expressions, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot in this little uh, mini scene that deserves analysis, including that Wittgenstein examines speech acts, as we could now call them, uh, um, as well as an ever increasing number of factors the enunciation of these words, the tone and facial expression. But what I want to focus on is the scene itself, namely the fact that Wittgenstein, in his late philosophy, invents many of these mini scenes that are used almost as dramatic experiments for the purposes of testing different hypotheses. And, um, and that's how Wittgenstein uses it. He keeps coming back to this scene and runs different kind of hypotheses and versions of the scene almost as a kind of test. So there's the dimension of character then. So what is the what are the contours of these Wittgensteinian mini scenes? There's the dimension of character. Uh, um, that's like he invents characters in these scenes here called A and B, but there's it's of course 
clear that he's uh, uh, that we know very little about these characters, and we need to know very little about these characters. He's not interested in their interiority, uh, in their inner processes, and that's in keeping with his approach. Maybe that he doesn't want to explain different language uses through reference to inner processes. Language needs to be explained through an emphasis on acts, on internal behavior, not form of interiority. And there's a dimension of scene, uh, which is, of course, the eminently dramatic category, which here is extremely spare, furnished only with a few props. These props are central, uh, and, and these props um, activate the scenario, and I understand the central question that the scenario is supposed to answer. So, characters, scenes, mini dramas, one would say, all over Wittgenstein's work. And this is precisely the reason why a dramatist like Tom Stoppard would become interested in Wittgenstein. So, Stoppard takes this setup, this scenario, and then modifies it. As he says, Tom Stoppard does in his introduction to Dog's Hamlet, he was drawn to this material and ended up using it um, um, in order to write a quote, play which had to teach the audience the language the play was written in. What would happen, and of course, what would happen, Stoppard asks, if the central terms of the play, planks, slabs, cubes, these building materials with which Wittgenstein starts, with which Stoppard starts, didn't actually have the meaning they had in English, but instead denoted uh, respectively ready, okay, next, and thank you. Stoppard promptly proceeds to play out of this scenario. And this is how it works. Even though it looks like A is calling for the different objects B throws in as they're building something on the stage, no such command is given. Um, actually, the, the two workers know exactly what they're doing. They don't have to communicate about this working process, the action they are engaged in. Instead, they're engaging in everyday chit-chat. Uh, chit-chat using these words that actually mean something else. So um, while Wittgenstein here is interested in, in the scene in how we use words and how words relate to objects, Stoppard is uh, interested in something else, I mean this discrepancy between words and practice. He confronts different uh, misunderstandings about the relationship between words and objects and words and practice. Um, Dog's Hamlet, uh, this play, starts with a different game, actually, also related to an interest of Wittgenstein, namely a ball game. Um, it's with this ball game that Stoppard starts to actually try to teach the audience this new language, the new language the play is written. Um, so the way this works is that Wittgenstein, that Stoppard introduces the audience to different scenarios, like the ball game or like a lunch break, where characters use the different words in the play in this coded language, but pretty quickly we as the audience can figure out what these words mean. Why? Because we finally understand the practice they are embedded in, right? So for example, during the lunch break, uh, the characters ex exchange sandwiches and we see the sandwiches and we learn the language they use in order to communicate about this language. Or for example, in the ball game, we understand the language uh, in which uh, this play is written. But then, um, of course, uh, 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 Stoppard would not be Stoppard if he didn't introduce a problem into the scenario. This problem comes in the form of a lorry driver who speaks English. And then may all, you know, mayhem ensues because the lorry driver doesn't understand that the two characters use English words, but that they have completely different meanings. So then a collision of languages happens. And this is also an occasion for a lot of comedy. Now, for good measure, Stoppard also introduces a meta-theatrical dimension. Because it turns out over the course of the play that the builders uh, use these cubes and slabs and so on and so forth to build a stage. Build a stage on which Hamlet will be performed by the end of the play, a short version of Hamlet. And Hamlet, thank God, is going to be performed in English. 
So we learn this coded language, and then finally the play culminates with Shakespeare uh, in English. So how is this approach really? What can be? What kind of consequences can be? Uh, uh, does this play have for Wittgenstein? Um, the best way of answering this, I think, is to ask how do we learn the language of this play, Dog? Um, at first pause, it seems like Augustine would offer the best explanation, and Augustine is also how Wittgenstein opens to the philosophical investigation. We, learn, we observe how different characters use words by looking at the objects they handle, right? Sandwiches, the ball, and so on and so forth. Um, but this Augustinian explanation doesn't really work, I would say, because dog is not a proper language at all. It doesn't have a grammar that's independent from English, and in all other ways is completely parasitic on English. It's just a coded version of English. It's not a new language. So, um, in fact, we, I think, only understand dog so quickly in a play because we are embedded in a language practice that we have learned in a very different way, in a way that Wittgenstein, I think, explains the best. So it looks like Stoppard uh, actually uses St. Augustine and that therefore this would be kind of a critique of Wittgenstein anti-Augustinian stance, but I think in the end is actually not because this is just um, a coded version of English. So an interesting engagement, I would say, with this dimension of Wittgenstein's thought. Um, I think there's a larger lesson to be learned here about Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's approach to language. And I think Stoppard's play really calls attention to that. And that is, more generally, this kind of dramatic dimension of Wittgenstein's late philosophy. And one could even start with the word language game, what's usually translated into English as language, the word language game itself. The German word it's based on is Sprachspiel. The important thing about that is that in German, there's no distinction between game and play. Both terms are expressed with the word Spiel. Now, what's lost in the standard translation of Sprachspiel into language game is it's a contraction. It's an emphasis, and it's important for Wittgenstein's philosophy, on rule-governed activities, and rule-following is crucial for Wittgenstein's, uh, um, for Wittgenstein's say, philosophy. Chess is an important uh, you know, a, a example that he uses again and again for this kind of rule-governed dimension of language. But there's another dimension, and that is denoted also by the word spiel, and that should be translated as play. Early on in the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein lists a whole range of examples of Sprachspiel, what he used as Sprachspiel, and among them is playing theater. Now, playing theater, I think, cannot be captured with this conventional translation of language game, the emphasis, as, as the English word game uh, suggested, on uh, rule governing but I think has this larger, and here I would say dramatic dimension of playing theater, playing roles, and also in Wittgenstein's case, of writing philosophy in a quasi-dramatic form by inventing these different kind of mini language games or scenarios of which his late philosophy is crucially composed. So that's the kind of dramatic dimension of Wittgenstein. And uh, uh, I think a, a dimension that's highlighted when a playwright such as Stoppard gets his hands on Wittgenstein and really highlights this kind of uh, dramatic dimension. So, 1979, Tom Stoppard's Dog's Hamlet, um, the last of this kind of early uh, responses to Wittgenstein, and one I want to now rush on to a second group and talk about them only very briefly. Um, a group of Wittgenstein's heirs writing in the 1980s and 90s, which, curiously enough, turns out to be the high watermark of these literary responses um, to Wittgenstein. If one just looks numerically, there are a few early ones, including the ones I've mentioned, 
and then there's an explosion, really, a kind of increase, radical increase in literary responses to Wittgenstein. And I have some uh, uh, suggestions about why, why that is in the 80s and 90s. Two things are interesting about these, the second wave, if you will, of responses. First, that they're not from either Austria or England, the way these earlier ones were, but from North America. Um, and uh, they're not pri prim primarily novelistic or dramatic. Many of these late, uh, later uh, literary heirs are poets. This is something rather new. We still have novels, including the, one of the great <coughs> contemporary American uh, writers, David Foster Wallace, whose first novel, The Room of the System from 87, is a Wittgenstein novel. It revolves around a, a grandmother who's absent from the novel, who is a radical Wittgenstein, and this becomes kind of the uh, central figure of this novel. And a, a second novel from 87 by David Markson called Wittgenstein's Mistress, which is a very experimental uh, uh, novel that's interesting that I could talk, talk about at great length. But generally speaking, it's no longer novelists and dramatists who are at the forefront of these Wittgenstein responses, it's poets. And let me just uh, conclude by talking about very few of them. And probably you will not have heard of them. And I want to introduce you to them. One is called Jan Zwicky. And he wrote a little booklet in 1986 called Wittgenstein Elegies. It's a short book of poetry written under the direct influence of the philosopher. Wittgenstein Elegies sound central themes of Wittgenstein's philosophy language, both early and late. And that's another pattern. Many of these later responses combine the early work and the late work of Wittgenstein in interesting ways. For example, Jan Zwicky uses uh, phrases like that are well known and you will all recognize the world is all that is the case, or he echoes particular thoughts. Words show us everything. But recasting thoughts to be found in Wittgenstein's writing is not the primary point here. Jan Zwicky also often expands on Wittgenstein's metaphors, as for example in this line. To see is to be unafraid to cast away the ladder we have cherished. For our language is an ancient city, maze of interlocking streets and squares. To know it, we must walk it, crawl through sewers, feel our way by night along the walls. Most answers squat, squat before us humbler questions. So this is a kind of sound of these allergies. Um, these works use a reservoir of words and expressions and terms that are crucial to Wittgenstein. Object, world, logic, sign, hidden, representation. And when reading through these allergies, one remembers Wittgenstein's texts, finds echoes, extensions, reflections, a poet responding to Wittgenstein, the writer. To be sure, the fascination with Wittgenstein's person is not entirely gone. In fact, by the 80s, Wittgenstein has become this kind of cultural icon. So Zwicky also writes, quote, wealth clutters, opulence breeds death, or work in philosophy is work upon oneself, slow chip and duration. But these biographical concerns you might call them, are directly related to language, how we choose and place words, how to pare them down, how the work on language is the central occupation that Zwicky shares with Wittgenstein. Next one I want to introduce is a poet named Rosemary Waldrop, whose central work is Reproduction of Profiles, is the title also from 87, these are all published in the same year, <clears throat> a short book of prose poems in the tradition of Mallarmé. Like Zwicky, Waldorf extends, in some cases, adds to Wittgenstein's metaphor. Just to give you another example, quote, visibility was poor, the field limited by grammatical rules, the four, the four horns of language. Let me say that again, visibility was poor, the field limited by grammatical rules, common the four points of language. Her main strategy is to ask, to take Wittgenstein's own questions 
Is a picture of the world real? What is a name? When is a picture like a ruler equal to reality? And to gently bend them in different directions. Quote, the proportion of accident in my picture of the world falls with the rain. Or, truth can be strenuous. It makes you lean against the window frame. Throughout these examples, it's, there's language come from the Tractatus and personalized. That's an important twist, she adds. First, these prose poems are addressed, as much of Wittgenstein's later writings, to another person, a you. The, this way, the prose poems take on the flavor of a conversation. And this echoes, of course, this whole concern with dialogue. Uh, for example, everything that can be thought at all, you said, can be thought over. Or, so I agree, you said, that there were languages to be admired rather than understood. Sometimes we even have outright dialogue. Quote, if I could only accept similes, you began. But I interrupted with a question about your body of doctrine. That, you said, would take rhythm and logic in afternoon rotation. So what we have here is prose poems that select terms and thoughts from the term habits and bend them in the direction of everyday life, turn them into dialogue, interweave the later and the earlier work of Wittgenstein. I think I should come to a conclusion. Um, and um, I want to end with one more work, uh, a final air of Wittgenstein's, not primarily a literary nor dramatic one, namely the Hungarian filmmaker Peter Forbach. In the early 90s, so we're still in that sort of central piece of the moment of flowering, he created a film called Wittgenstein's Fractatus. It was actually the first Wittgenstein-inspired work I came across shortly after it came out in the early 90s. It kind of stayed with me, I think, and lingered in my uh, mind, uh, prompting me finally to understand this, and to undertake this project. So this film consists of three layers of moving images, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to conclude by showing you a brief clip of images, sound, and text, text written across the street. The images are mostly home videos from the first half of the 20th century. Hungarians, mostly Super 8 films. Hungarians filming each other, sometimes performing for the camera, doing a little dance, or else there's a wedding or a party, children playing, people at a beach. On occasion, a still image is presented over which someone has been drawing, for example, circling a face or but drawing a diagram with numbers. Um, there are also more ominous images of men in uniforms, airplanes, German shepherds, trains. It's clear that this private world of these home videos is somehow, is somehow being threatened. And then there's a consistent humming. Someone is humming a single melody throughout the film. Finally, there's the tractatus. There's a voice that reads with an Hungarian accent passages from the tractatus, interspersed with quotes from the so-called secret diaries written during Wittgenstein's secret diaries written during World War One, in which Wittgenstein talks about everything that he didn't want to talk about in the Tractatus, including religion and his fear, uh, death, and so on and so forth. And finally, there are sentences taken from the Tractatus, including their numbers, that are written across the screen. This film has a distinctly elegiac quality. Home videos are from another world. Remnants of a world destroyed by two world wars, the Cold War, everything else that happened in the 20th century. By embedding the tractatus within these images, I think, Forgot very deliberately places it in a remote time and place. The philosophical equivalent, perhaps, of old home videos. This, I think, historical distance distancing helps us highlight the extent to which the Tractatus perhaps sought to el eliminate history along with contingency, confusion, and crisis, um, a utopian project that failed. In 1986, Jan Zwicky, who I mentioned, entitled his Wittgensteinian poem, Wittgenstein Elegies. A few, few years later, 
Forgash creates this very powerful allergy for Wittgenstein. These six years from 1986 to 92 saw this unprecedented flowering of Wittgenstein literature, particularly these poetic uh, responses, flowering tinged with the sense of allergy. So let me just conclude by, and I hope we'll manage to do this, with just a few minutes from this powerful film. So let's see how we can start this very good. And I hope we'll have sound as well. Okay, we don't seem to have sound. Do we need to switch the sound? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. It's too bad. I think we probably no. I'm concerned that the sound doesn't work, but I don't know how to. I didn't know you knew your sound. Oh, uh, if their sound was here earlier, though, let me try to. Their sound? I don't think so. It, it doesn't matter, I'll just show the images so the sound is powerful. It's not on. It's okay. Don't worry about it. philosophy or the, the, the language of Wittgenstein into other genres of expression, could it also be described as style or is it ideas or is it, what is it that moves? What is it, how, how, how would you define that thing which, like a trope, like a metaphor, but, but what, what is it exactly that is moving? Is it a stylistic feature? Is it a quote? It's a very, very good question, Ray. So, so, slightly different way of framing this question, so phrasing this question would be what, what makes us recognize yeah. Wittgenstein, right? In these, especially in these poetic, uh, in, in the earlier responses, the novels, it's clear there's a Wittgenstein character who's introduced, right? So that anchors the whole work and clearly orients it towards Wittgenstein. 
is too long for the in the case of Stopper, it's directly taking this dramatic scene and sort of running with it and teasing out its theatrical dimension, how it's said. But then it becomes more interesting in these late poetic responses, right? So, and there the question is what makes us even recognize it? So yes, I think style is, is, is certainly part of it because by the, by the late 20th century, <laughs> there's clearly something stylish about Wittgenstein, right? That there he has these recognizable ways of phrasing things, both in the current part of the philosophical investigations, that we can recognize and pick up on. And uh, so it's, it's certainly style in the sense of um, a distinct way of using language. Um, so sometimes I think it is a matter of accumulation of keywords, even essential keywords, but also phrasing them. Um, and sometimes it's his, his own famous metaphors, like the latter metaphor and so on and so forth. So it, it's certainly a testament to the extent to which, certainly in the ladies, in, in the 80s and 90s, Wittgenstein circulates through culture. In some cases, you can clearly see that these poets that came of age when they studied Wittgenstein in college. David Foster Wallace, for example, wrote a senior thesis on, on, on language philosophy in Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein just becomes very widespread as a philosopher of language. And these poets pick up on various uh, aspects of them. Sometimes it seems more argumentative and really an engagement with the philosophy of Wittgenstein. Um, but at other times, I agree, it's more a response to what I call Wittgenstein the writer. Uh, and that certainly includes style, how Wittgenstein handles language. It's style in that sense. Yeah. So it, it's, it's hard to come up with one description for all of them. But I think certainly in this later moment, um, there is a reliance on style, including these being poets. This is what draws them to it. That's the recognition that they hear someone who doesn't just think about language, but practices language in a distinct and recognizable and reproducible manner. Reproduction of profiles is Rosemary Waldrop's time. Yeah. So this would be a short, we have, don't have much time, so I'll, I'll give that as a, a short answer. Thank you. First, uh, I, know. Um, I was really very happy you suggest the concept, uh, the Wittgenstein concept of Sprachspiel uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. and the translation in English and in Portuguese and in French who always uh, erases the one of the most important sense of Spiel. Yeah. And this is the first time I hear, uh, uh, and I'm very glad because I, I think all the same. Uh, perhaps the translation uh, should be double. Yeah, it has language to be. Language game and language play. play. Well, play. Yes. I think word play is the other way to say language game. No? Word, word play. Oh, word play. Word that play. would be the more extreme but version. But it is. But it is. This is an interpretation already because right. it's, it's just hard. Uh, I think it's, it's very good to stress this this double sense. Yeah. This very rich in German. Or even simple German people can understand this. Right. Right. Uh, the other thing is, I was really impressed with this uh, short. Uh, Presentation of uh, the, the Hungarian filmmaker. It's, it's unbelievably good. Uh, absolutely yeah. astonishing yeah. and amazing. And I think it has to do with the relationship between philosophy and other things yeah. arts, movies, literature, and also has to do with this difference that Iris Murdoch stresses. Uh, the second you have mentioned this. Wittgenstein against the written word. And several times, not many times, but several times, 
in letters and in 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 fragments, autobiographical fragments, for instance, and also in the preface of 45 to the philosophical investigation, this all also stresses this. He would not like to have a school, the Italian school. And I think this desire of him has to do with this not hesitation, it is deeper. He writes already. He writes, it's true. Uh, yeah, it's true. He writes uh, and writes uh, a lot. But the things he writes are always in a state of fragmentary expression and are always, always in a state of being reviewed and, and so forth. Uh, and then uh, perhaps I, I should help and ask you the best way of being an heir of Wittgenstein is it's not. Uh, giving a new commentary about him, but to write a play or doing a film. Yeah. I couldn't agree more, and I think uh, it's for comments, wonderful comments, thank you. Uh, um, yes, so um, I read language game and language play, one really means both. It's interesting, of course, one, one can blame Wittgenstein, I mean, Wittgenstein, I think, in a profound way, thought in German. Yeah. Though he lectured mostly in English, and he himself used the word language game, uh -huh. but I think he wasn't bothered by it because he continued to hear in his mind the much more expansive meaning of play. So I totally agree. Really, one 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 needs both. Um, and so the film, it's interesting. Yes. So the the film, you know, these this footage records. Um, these scenes. There's the spoken word, but of course there's also the writing. So the film really confronts these two modes. It is not, it doesn't seem to me to kind of celebrate. And that would be too easy to just celebrate the pure spoken word, right? That's what happens to the Wittgenstein character in Murdoch's novel, but really it's a complicated relationship and a, a, a necessary relationship. And it's one of the great things about this film. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, uh, that it really forces us to recognize that uh, by also giving us the written word across the screen, not just the spoken word. And this is, as you as you said, is precisely Wittgenstein struck. Um, so, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Three questions. Excuse me. Sorry, no, I just wanted to follow up on that because I was actually really struck by this image at the end. And it actually um, threw me back to your opening comment about the 20th century um, drama of language philosophy. And I thought these very poignant words um, with respect to um, the, the, the drama that you're coming to, or yeah. in other words, the drama of this work too, which is the notion yeah. of the um, no longer believing that language is the path. To knowledge, and I just wonder what struck me with those images at the end was, um, on the one hand, this phrase, everything we see could also be seen otherwise, everything we could describe could also be described otherwise. And that combined with this notion of the aphoristic language in this way that even the Wittgensteinian sort of the aphorism, that there's always <coughs> sort of a gesture towards language and the juxtaposition of the spoken word with the written word with these. Um, these gorgeous scenes, black and white scenes with people in the background in a, in a realm that seems so far yeah. outside or beyond language. And I just wonder what what are the stakes, what's at stake of sort of seeking to have the world be described by language? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, that's really a wonderful way of putting it. And um, of course, you know, there is, so what I have in mind when I describe a kind of no longer believing a certain extreme form of language philosophy is obviously something like war or something like you know this radical linguistic constructivism that is called. But of course, you know Wittgenstein, as, as Wittgensteinians in the room or whatever would be the first to point out. Of course, Wittgenstein has this very powerful notion of names, form, or forms of life, and th that certainly is something I also think of in these scenes from the movie. That these are forms of life you see. Preserve historical forms of life, remote forms of life. So, um, but um, 
I, I don't have an answer, but I really like this formulation. What is at stake in wanting language to explain everything? I don't know, but I think that's a wonderful way of phrasing it, and maybe a nice way of ending the session. Thank you very much.